Top of the morning to you for our vast Irish Lynchburg audience, right? Uh, but uh, for the rest of us, we're so glad that you're here today. And uh, it's going to be a great day of just worshiping the Lord together. And come on in and find a seat. We're glad that you're joining us here uh, online and also in the room. We've got some exciting things coming up this week. First of all, if it's your first time with us today, uh, fill out a Connect card. Uh, you can go to the, uh, take your phone out and just scan the QR code on the seats in front of you and fill out the Connect card. Anything that we can do to help you take your next step, we want to do that. Uh, there's some uh, neat things that are coming up, two or three announcements I want you to hear right as we get going here. This Friday night, Karen Kingsbury is actually going to be here. Some of you have read her books and you appreciate her ministry. Uh, one of her books, Someone Like You, uh, has been made into a movie, and this Friday night, 7 p.m., that we're going to be hosting that. So you can get more information uh, on our website, but join us for that. This Wednesday night, our kids' ministry is hosting a TRFX, and that's a Thomas Road family special experience where moms and dads and kids all get together. Uh, Miss Jane and our whole kids' ministry team does a great job. So Wednesday night, bring your kids out and be part of that. Easter is coming up. It's just right around the corner. We're going to have some invite cards for you today to go share with people. But we want to remind you that Easter times, 8 o'clock, 9, 15, 11 o'clock. 8 o'clock, 9, 15, and 11 o'clock. And those are family services. You're going to bring your kids in here with you. It's going to be a great, great service. We have a lot of great ministries, as you know, that go on all around this uh, church. We mentioned kids ministry and, and everything we do for uh, Easter, our great worship community getting ready for that. But we also have a great adult ministry and specifically our senior adults. Uh, Kent does a great job, Pastor Kent and the team there. But we want you to watch this quick video about what's going on with our senior adult ministry at Thomas Road. Take a look at this. I think it's really important for people at Thomas Road to have a place to go to just engage in, in everyday life and also to have a, a, a time of fellowship and a time of, of fun, if you will. Happy, happy, happy birthday to you, to you, to you. Woo! One of the things that, that I believe uh, we miss out on sometimes is the laughter. Our activities that we do are, uh, really are reaching out one is we have a senior life choir that goes in uh, at Christmas time. They'll go back in in the spring. Uh, we do a Sunday service at Liberty Ridge, uh, Runk and Pratt. And God's pit crew was the one that just really took off. And um, they're a, it's a great organization. We went from nine people the first month to now we're averaging over 30 every month that we go. The other thing that we do is, is to take trips again. And last year we went on seven trips. Uh, to, that were overnight trips. So many times um, as we get older, we start thinking, well, I've lived my usefulness, but our plan and our goal is to, uh, to make them feel like you still have a job to do, you still have a purpose. It's a wide range of people, uh, different socioeconomics, but it's, it's a good group of people. I know for me personally, uh, when I came to Thomas Road and became part of Senior Life, it was a healing process. And sometimes when we lose something, a job, or we leave our job or whatever, it, we just need something to fill it in. And, and I think that's what Senior Life does, is, it's a, is it fills the void for people and it allows us to love people and to love God. Let's fill this room with praise. Our God is worthy, amen? Oh, come on. Sing this with us. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. And I'll praise when I'm down. I'll praise when Cause praise is the water, my enemies drown. Oh, come on, sing this. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason in prayer.
your name today, Jesus. You are the cornerstone. We put all our hope and our trust in you today and forever. Let's sing this together, church. My hope is built.
the chief cornerstone. No matter what's happened to you this week, you can stand and hold on to that cornerstone, that rock, that foundation that never moves. And we will continue to hold on to him throughout time and whatever comes our way. As we continue to worship this morning, uh, we're going to be taking our offering. We open our, our hearts. We open our treasure to Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, where your, where your heart is, is your treasure, and where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. And so we give to him, and we always thank you for giving, because that what help us, what helps us to further the gospel and to make disciples around the world, starting here in Lynchburg. But as we pray, you know, be praying for the ministries of this church. Obviously, be praying for Easter coming up. I want you to think as uh, you have an opportunity to get one of our Easter invite cards in just a few moments at the end of the service. I want you to think right now as we pray, who are you praying for for Easter? Who is it that you and your family can invite to be in here with us? Who from your school or from your place of work or your neighbor or the person from the gym, who is it? that you can invite to hear about the cornerstone of life, the Savior, Jesus Christ. So pray about that. Just don't think about it. Ask God, God, who do you want me to bring here or to invite? And as we pray today, we have a lot of people that need that cornerstone in their life. They need that firm foundation. And let's pray for these folks. In the hospital, Wayne Austin, continue to pray for Amanda Crosswhite, Gary Dupriest, Dennis Iverson, and Otis Wright. And then keep praying for a lot of these that are sick and many of you that are listening right now. We just want to extend God's comfort and encouragement and courage to you in hospital rooms and uh, senior facilities, just places that you're at maybe that you can't get out today and you're going through health issues. Let's pray for them. But uh, Lee Cowan, pray for Vicki Kusek, Gail Gillespie, Heather Kirk, Tim Lax, Edna Little, Anise Maddox, Kay Razor, Amy Sandage, Stanchock Jr., Madison Krantz. And then for three that have gone home to be with Jesus, they made it to the other shore uh, this past week. Pray for these and a couple services that are coming up. For Mary Jones, for her family, uh, memorial is this uh, Monday, tomorrow, and here in Pate Chapel at noon. Pray for the homegoing of Bill Peterson. And then for Jennifer Tyree, and that funeral will be Wednesday, 11 a.m., right here in Pate Chapel as well. Father, we are grateful to you for bringing us in here today, for giving us another day, bringing the sun up, putting air in our lungs, and helping us to just walk through this day. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your sacrifice on Calvary, for raising from the dead on Easter. Now, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would guide us as we pray and ask you, who do you want us to bring to these services to hear your message. Lord, we lift these up that need you. God, just fill our hearts with your presence. In the next few minutes as we hear your word, Lord, may we hear your word, but also respond. Whatever you tell us from your word, we will do. We love you, Jesus. We are your people. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue in worship? We remember your steadfast love. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that He will keep.
Faithfulness of God, aren't you grateful for it? You know, before I jump into Mark chapter 2, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. I did want to just point out, because we can't, we can't just let this go. You noticed our drummer today, right? So, Josh, come on over here real quick. Are you all wired up right here? So this is Josh Detweiler. Josh is the band director over Brookville High School. And so some people thought that he did this because of St. Patrick's Day. That is not at all what it is. It's way more hilarious. Yeah, he had a deal with his students that if they did a certain thing, I don't even know the story, but that he would do this. It's a fundraiser. A fundraiser. And so they, they went over the limit, and he did this, and he's regretting every moment of it. 
now, but it's all for the kids, right? It is. If, you, uh, if there was a question, definitely Protestant, if you were not sure on your side, because Green is St. Patty's Day, but yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. It's <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, thank you, Josh. And, and I don't think he knew he was scheduled to play when he made that deal on this Sunday, but it worked out great. Hey, uh, yeah, we're going to Mark chapter 2 today. We're going to continue our series, Beyond Belief, talking about the miracles of Christ. And uh, before we jump in, let's pray that God blesses the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your gratefulness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for who you are, God. We stand here today. We're overwhelmed, Lord, in all that you have done and continue to do in our lives. And so when we use that phrase, that tag, beyond belief, God, it is beyond belief what you continue to do. And so, God, we stand here today, and we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the hope that is found in the cross. We thank you for the hope that is found in the empty tomb. And as we march toward Easter here just in a couple of weeks, God, we pray that you would, uh, Lord, guide our hearts towards the lost in our community, that we would be focused on what we can do to reach them, to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to bring them to the place Lord, that they could hear the gospel and that they would make the decision to trust you. And God, we'll give you the praise for it. Now, as we open your word, I pray that you would illuminate it in our hearts. God, help us to see uh, you at work today in this place. And Father, today, if there's someone here or watching or listening today who has never come to that place where they've trusted and believed that Jesus is your son, that he died and rose again, I pray today would be the day that they would have that understanding, that they would trust and believe in you and they would call on your name. And as scripture very clearly tells us, that they call on your name and they will be saved. And God, we'll give you the praise in advance for the work you're gonna do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we're gonna be today in Mark chapter two. Uh, again, a passage of scripture that uh, has, a, has a great, great story, a great element of the miraculous power of God. Um, and I've entitled this, uh, this series, this uh, sermon today, and you, and you guys are familiar with the story, there's no question about it, but I've entitled the sermon Through the Roof. Now, oftentimes when we use that phrase, through the roof, it can mean lots of different things. Like sometimes you get to the point where you're really upset and you go through the roof, you're mad, right? Uh, other times, you know, great things happen, man, it's just through the roof, it's awesome. And today we're going to be talking about through the roof the other way, coming down from the roof down into the room. As you know, the story of Jesus when he heals the, the paralytic there, when the friends bring him to Jesus. And so that's kind of the, the understanding, the, the, the discussion that we're going to have today and talking about what Jesus did. But there are a couple of elements, as in every story, as in every element of scripture, there are a couple of things that we find. A couple of things that we kind of walk by, we, we kind of speed by as we're reading these passages, and we miss these, these very important things that, that, that God gives to us in his word that, that we need to grab a hold of because it's meaningful for us today. Obviously, someone could read scripture. They could read from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, and without understanding or without a desire to understand the, the context and the impact that it can have on our lives today. It's a great history book. It's a great story, a great, you know, drama. I mean, it's all of the things that are found in, in God's word. Like you could go through and you could do all of that and you can miss out on so very much. If you don't take the time to pull out of it what God intends for us to see. And so that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been talking through in this story today. One that is familiar is no different. And so for Mark chapter 2, we're going to begin with verse 1. And what we're going to do is kind of walk through the passage here. We'll read a couple of verses and then we'll stop and talk a little bit more. Then we'll read through some verses and we'll stop and talk a little bit more. But, but I want to start with the first two verses. So Mark chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, you read this passage. By the way, it's on 176 in your journal if you're following along. And you read the story. It says, and again, he was back in Capernaum. Now, if you go back to Mark chapter 1, we're not going to spend time there this morning, but Mark chapter 1 tells us that Jesus, he was there in Capernaum, and then he went out traveling. And he starts going out all over the region and he's preaching the gospel and he's healing, doing all kinds of things. In other words, what's happening is that his reputation is being built. People are hearing what Jesus is doing. 
They're seeing like these miraculous things that are taking place everywhere that he's going. The crowds that are gathering everywhere that he has, uh, has the opportunity of speaking and, and preaching. And so what happens here is this, and now he comes back to Capernaum, which is his home base. This is the place where he started his ministry. It's a place where uh, so many places in scripture we read about what he did in Capernaum. But there's an interesting little phrase here. It says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Now, you ought to underline that statement, in the house, because oftentimes I've heard sermons preached of this passage before, and they've always said, you know, can you imagine sitting in that, that house and someone begins to, you know, cut through the roof and, and, and the dirt falls, and can you imagine how angry they must have been if, you know, if they were actually like cutting the roof of this guy's house to, to bring this man to Jesus, but... If you look in the New American Standard Bible, it says that he was at home. In other words, there's a kind of an inclination that we can pull, an inference that we can pull from that passage that tells us one of a couple of different things. Uh, and I believe probably that he was probably in the house of Peter. Uh, Peter was from that area and Peter's mother-in-law lived in that area. And so I think that probably he was either in Peter's or Andrew's house or, or maybe a house that he and Peter had shared or the disciples shared in that place. And, and so in the New American Standard, which by the way is, a, is a, a translation that kind of is really, really connected to the original Hebrew and the original Greek and kind of walking through. And, and it says that he was at home. And so I don't think it's a, I don't I think that's the right way to read it to think that you know some they were in some random house that he just walked down the street and just walked into a house and all of a sudden somebody's cutting a hole in the roof. I, I think they were actually in their house. I think they were in the house that was very closely connected to uh, the disciples or Jesus himself. Then in verse two it says, and immediately they they all gathered together there so that there was no longer room to receive them. In other words, the house was overflowing. But like people, it was it was like we're outside the door, standing room only. I mean, the place was jam-packed. You know the story. And then it says, and he preached the word to them. Oftentimes in scripture, we see that, that it was the custom of Jesus that wherever he went, whatever city he might be in, he would go to the synagogue and he would preach and he would uh, preach the gospel. And so here we see once again that that word, that, that word preach, that Greek word laleo, that he was there. And he was actually giving to them the word, the logos, the, the good news of the gospel. He's preaching the gospel in that place. And he was doing that wherever he went, which is why, as we continue to read, that we begin to see kind of the, 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 the main part of this story, you know, kind of the, 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 the huge arc in this story of the, the things that happen here as we continue to read in verse 3, that we see that four faithful friends, four faithful friends would stop at nothing for a miracle for their friend. Look what it says in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, and then they came to it bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now again, we want to see everything we, in this scripture. We want to see everything that's in the text here. So if you go back to the beginning of verse 3, it says, then they came to him. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we marked chapter 8, and it says they brought the blind man to Jesus. They brought the the blind man to Jesus here in Mark chapter 2, it says, Then they, whoever they are, friends, they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, what we can read into that is this, is yes, there were four men who were carrying this paralytic on a mat, but probably there was a larger crowd that brought them. Because the passage tells us they brought a man who was carried by four men. So in other words, kind of the idea that we can get here is probably it was more than four. It was probably a crowd of people that were together. A, a lot of friends, a lot of people who probably, you know, when they heard that Jesus had come back to the city, that he'd come back to Capernaum, that he's back now at his house, probably a, a bunch of people got together and said, you know, we ought to take, you know, let's call him, let's call him John. Well, we got to take John. Now John's a disciple. That would get confusing. Let's call him uh, Billy Bob, okay? So the paralytic is Billy Bob. And so they're sitting there saying, man, we've got to get Billy Bob to Jesus because we've heard all these stories of what Jesus has been doing. Man, he's been healing blind people and lame. Like, we've got to get Billy Bob over to Jesus because if we can get Billy Bob there, then obviously it's going to be transformed. Like, he might be able to walk again. And so these, these people, these four plus others, I believe there was a group of them. 
And they got together and they, they, they went to find Billy Bob and, and probably Billy Bob was at his house. He probably didn't come out much. He was probably homebound, probably sitting in there on his mat. He's sitting there watching TV. He's got the remote. He's flipping through all the channels and, you know, he's watching the, you know, the, the, the fishing channel or the sports channel, watching the game, whatever it might be. And so th they go in and they find Billy Bob and they get him and they, they get the mat and they, they carry him down. They're carrying him down the street. They're making their way down the street of Capernaum, not a big city, but obviously a city without cars and a city without mass transportation is a bigger city than what we experience today. And they finally make their way. They turn the corner. And as they turn the corner, they see there's a lot of people that are gathered around the house. They get closer and they closer and closer. And then when they finally got there, they realized, man, there's just too many people. We can't get any closer. There's no way we're going to be able to, to, to get anywhere near it. Man, we can't. They've tried to work through it. Again, remember now, it's four people carrying Billy Bob on a mat and probably another group of people around them. So probably it could be, you know, 10, 15, 20, might even more they were all gathered together, pushing through the crowd, and there's no way that they can get through that crowd and get all the way to, to where Jesus was. But remember what I said a moment ago. These were at least four faithful friends who would stop at nothing to get their friends to Jesus, to, to experience the miraculous. And so when they finally make their way there, they come up with a plan they hatched a plan that they were going to go through a different route. They couldn't get through the door. They probably couldn't get through the window. Too many people around, people, people like surrounding the windows, looking inside. They didn't have like the nice, you know, Pella windows like we have today. You know, they, they, were, they were just openings and they were sitting there listening to what Jesus was saying as he was Laleo, preaching the Logos, the word. But then they see the stairwell. See, every house back in those days it was kind of tradition, kind of the way they did things back in ancient, uh, ancient times, back in, in the first century there. Houses were one-story houses. And these one-story houses were made, and they were kind of made with, with mud on the sides. They would put the walls together. They would carve some holes in the windows, uh, in the walls for windows so they could look out. And, and then on the roof, they would actually make it to be a flat roof, and they would build some kind of a staircase or a ladder on the outside of the house. And they would go up on top of the roof for relief from inside because it gets pretty hot inside. And they would go up there. They would eat meals there. They would, they would gather friends together there, kind of like decks, like back decks like we have today. In fact, here, here's kind of what they do. I'll show you a picture here. So this is kind of how they made the roofs of the houses back in there. You can see the walls there, mud and rocks all pressed together. And then they would take these, these logs and they would put these logs across uh, there. And then in the next picture, after the logs were there, they go to the, let's go to the next picture, guys, that they would then take these, these reeds, these smaller wooden reeds and longer pieces, and they would put them on top opposite, across hatching there, across the logs. They would put those there to, again, to provide some kind of structure for what they do next. Let's go to the next picture. And here you can see from the inside, you can see the logs across. You can see where they've got the, the reeds there. They, they take mud and they kind of press them up. Go into the next picture, guys, if you would. And this is a cross section. You can see this is what a roof would have looked like in that day. So you see the bottom, you see the logs going this way. Then you see the logs going the opposite way. You'll see all kinds of rocks and mud and, and stuff that was kind of stuffed in there in the middle. And then on top of it, they would come and they would get a bunch of mud there and they would roll it. They actually had these, these kind of modified rollers that wheels did exist back in these days, right? And they had the, the wheels and they would actually roll that out and they would make it, you can see the, the wheel there, that kind of thing there, that machine with the wood on the side. And they would roll that mud down, get it harder and harder and harder and harder until that surface of the roof could actually support a lot of people sitting on top. Now, I think there's one more picture. This is what it would look like from the inside. And this is a typical house from that time, from that time period. You would see the, you know, the windows that were there. You would see what was inside. You would see the roof. And so they're gathered in this place. And Jesus is preaching the word. He's preaching the, the gospel. He's preaching the good news to the people gathered in that room. And then all of a sudden, that roof that you see here, you can imagine as they're on top of the roof now and they've made their way up there, at least four guys carrying Billy Bob, they got to the top 
And they start using some kind of tools, some kind of implements, maybe some rocks, maybe some sticks that they found. And they start carving away of that, that mud surface that we saw a moment ago. Now, if you read this story in Luke chapter 5, in Luke chapter 5, I believe it's in verse 19, uh, Luke records it is that they peeled away the tiling or they, they lifted the tiles. Now, some people say that that's a controversy, that's a, a discrepancy in Scripture. That in some elements that, you know, Luke was saying there were tiles there, but yet Mark talks about how that they uncovered the roof, a roof like this. And I don't think there's a discrepancy at all because when you see that kind of roof on the top where it's hardened, that hard clay actually would end up looking like tiles. And Luke speaking from that perspective. Again, I don't think there's any discrepancy at all. And so what the passage says is they begin to dig through the roof. And you can imagine being in that room. And listening very carefully to what Jesus is saying as he's preaching the good news, the logos, the gospel. He's preaching the word to them. And so if we were gathered in this room and if I was standing here today preaching and all of a sudden, like this group over here about halfway back, and all of a sudden you start feeling like little things dropping on your head. At first it wouldn't bother you much, right? But if it continued and all of a sudden, you know, you'd start seeing like light fixtures falling down and hitting your head, which they didn't have back then, but today we do. Or maybe like a steel beam would fall and drop down right. You wouldn't know it because you'd be dead. But can you imagine like all the other people around you and you start seeing all these things dropping. I see this one guy looking up. Like, it's not going to fall. I promise you. Seriously, this dude right about here, wave your hand. Yeah, he's looking up, looking at the steel beam because I said the whole dead thing. You're not going to die. I promise you. You're good. Okay. And so uh, they're, they're sitting there. All of a sudden, things just start to fall. And you can imagine the distraction as Jesus is preaching. I, I kind of, you know, kind of envision this happening a little bit differently maybe because it doesn't talk about it in the Scripture specifically. But I can kind of see that maybe Jesus stopped talking as the things are dropping down. Now, Jesus, of course, knows exactly what's happening. He knows exactly what's going on. No one else does, but he, of course, does. He's all-knowing. And so he probably stops talking. And as he stops talking, everybody kind of now is leaning into the silence because Jesus had been preaching and now everything is quiet. They're probably leaning in like, like what's going on? And all of a sudden things begin falling. You can imagine what the expectancy was in the room. Like what is going on? And then all of a sudden in this room, this modified church building, this church service where Jesus, the son of God is preaching. And all of a sudden, Billy Bob comes descending down through the roof. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Like what in the world is going on? Because they probably knew this paralytic. Again, Capernaum's not that large. They probably knew exactly who he was. They knew that he was paralyzed. Probably in scripture kind of infers this, that he probably was paralyzed because of his sin, he probably was, had the illness, the sickness, the disease that paralyzed him was probably as a result of sin in his life. So he had a reputation. He had a rep. Like this is a guy probably that not everybody wanted to hang out with and hang around. And all of a sudden, Billy Bob comes descending down through the roof. It's just amazing to me when you think about it, that these four friends at least would literally go through the, those incredible steps of digging through that hardened clay. I see Randy over here. Randy for years did landscaping and, and, and all of those types. You know how hard that must have been, that clay in the sun being beaten down on for all those years. Like it, it was a difficult task. It didn't happen like in five seconds. They didn't go in and like lift the hatch. I mean, it was a lot of work. But can you imagine what they must have gone through all for one reason? And that one reason was to get their friend into the presence of this man named Jesus that they had heard so much about. Kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? Of what we would do to get our friends into the presence of Jesus. Of how hard we might work to get them to that place where they could experience the power and the presence of Almighty God. So these four friends would stop at nothing but here's the cool thing. If we continue reading in verse 5, it's they got a lot more than they bargained for, a lot more than they hoped for. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your, sons, uh, your sins are forgiven you. 
So he saw their faith. And you ought to underline or highlight that word there. That's an interesting statement. Because you're sitting there recognizing and realizing Jesus was not only talking to the, the man who was paralyzed, but he also was seeing the faith of those who had lowered that man into his presence. He saw the collective faith, the hard work of those who got this man in the front presence of Jesus. And then he looked at this man and he saw this man and he makes this statement, son. Now that's an interesting, that's not a, in fact, you go back in the original Greek, it's the Greek word technon, which means child. Now that's not to say that this was a little kid. It was not a little kid. It was an adult. But it was a, a statement that Jesus made to put himself in a position of uh, looking at this as a child, like this person has come to me as a, an authority figure, coming to me as a, a parental type figure. And so he makes this statement, child, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now think about this for a moment. These four friends who are up on the roof and they're holding on to the, the ropes as they lower him down into the into this room and as, his, as that bed, as Billy Bob finally hits the ground, they're saying, oh, this is it, guys. This is it. We're getting ready to watch this. This is going to be amazing. This is going to be incredible. Billy Bob's going to jump up. He's going to do a little jig down there. He's going to dance. Like, this is awesome. This is amazing. And then Jesus says, ah, oh, your, your sins are forgiven. Got to be honest with you. These four friends are probably saying, uh, that's not what we're here for. That's not why we came. We didn't bring him here to get his sins forgiven. We brought him here to be healed. And yet Jesus' first statement, and again, it's purposeful now. Jesus, Jesus never did anything by accident. Everything was deliberate. Everything's a teachable moment. And so the first words out of his mouth were, son, child, your sins are forgiven. Now, let's keep reading. Because then we see the doubt that begins to persist in this room. Verses six and seven. And some of the scribes, anytime in scripture you see some of the scribes, you know that like some interesting things are about to happen, right? So some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Circle, highlight, underline, but God alone. Because that is the key statement in this entire story. But God alone. It's the key words in this entire passage we're reading today, 1 through 12 of chapter 2 of the book of Mark. But God alone. Now again, go back to this. Doubt persists. And you know, anytime the scribes are there, the Pharisees, anytime they're showing up, like they're doubting God, they're doubting Jesus, they're attacking Jesus, they're going after him, they want to put him to death, right? We've heard all the stories. But there's an interesting little kind of a sideline here that, that's interesting because what it says is this. They were reasoning in their hearts. What does that tell us? It tells us they didn't verbalize it. They didn't say out loud, how dare you, Jesus, say that his sins are forgiven? How dare you, Jesus, make this declaration? You don't have the power. Only God alone can do that. Now, again, Jesus doesn't do anything by accident, right? Everything's no randomness here in the acts of Jesus. These guys were sitting there. It's like, you know, they're sitting here, and, and I picked on you guys a moment ago. So they're sitting there like this guy with this really cool LU hat. I love the LU. Awesome. Great, great school. Okay, so they're sitting here, and all of a sudden they hear Jesus make that statement, your sins are forgiven. And all of a sudden the scribes, now obviously there's more than one, at least two, so you guys are the scribes. Okay, so the scribes are sitting here, and in their minds, here's what they're thinking. That guy's a jerk. How dare he say those words? He is blaspheming God himself. Only God can do that. And they're thinking that in their minds. So some of you in this room have been in this room before, maybe when I've been preaching and I've said something, and maybe in your mind you said, I can't believe he said that. And I know that because I've gotten some emails <laughs> that came later. Um, Thank you for those, by the way. They're very encouraging. Um, and so, so, so I know that sometimes you're sitting there and you're thinking things that you don't say out loud, but you're thinking them. Like, like, like you're just kind of in your heart, in your mind, like, man, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he wore that, right? And, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, like, like, what in the world? That's what the scribes are doing. But it's interesting because when the scribes don't verbalize it, 
Now, again, this is very important because remember, who is the only person who can forgive sins? And who said that? Okay, well, you guys are good because you're saying, well, he, he said they didn't say it. Okay, who was thinking that? The scribes, and the, and the scribes said it. So we have verification. That's what the scribes are thinking. So the scribes were thinking that only God can do it. They didn't verbalize it at all. But now look what Jesus does next. In the midst of this doubt, doubt Jesus gives mercy and grace and more. Because look what it says in verse 8. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. Okay, so let me put that in language we can kind of like understand, like we can like lean into. That as soon as the scribe sitting over here, the scribe wearing the LU hat. As soon as the scribe started thinking, how dare that man Jesus forgive, try to forgive. Only God can do that. Immediately. It says it here. This is scripture, not me. Immediately. Here's what happened. That Jesus speaks out and questions them on what they were thinking about questioning him. So in other words, what is Jesus doing here? He is proving their point. Don't you love that? That Jesus is actually fulfilling the, the questions of the scribes. He does it immediately. So it says, but immediately... When Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, that they were thinking this, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately, I love how three places here in this passage, the word immediately is there. So there's no questioning. There's no wondering. There's no time lapse here. There's no like, you know, at a later date, like he went to the doctor and got a shot. No, immediately it says that the man arose, took up the bed, and he went out in the presence of them all so that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So... Here's what happened. The scribes are sitting over here and the scribes are saying, I can't believe he said that. How dare he say that? He can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. They're not saying it out loud. They're thinking in their heart. They're sitting back probably with their arms crossed like, I can't believe that guy's doing this. I mean, probably that's what's going on. And instantly Jesus, who's over here, he's hanging out on the other part of the room where he'd been teaching the word, preaching the word. And instantly he kind of looks at the scribe. And he makes eye contact with the scribes. And he says this, why are you reasoning in your hearts about this? Can you imagine what the scribe thought? How did he know? How did he know I was thinking about him? How did he know that I thought that? He said, why are you reasoning in your heart? What would be harder for me to say, for, I forgive your sins or to heal the man who is paralyzed, right? So he said, like, which is the easier thing? Is it easier for me to simply say your sins are forgiven? Arguably, the easiest thing that would have been happened in that room is for him to say your sins are forgiven. And then four guys pick up Billy Bob and they carry Billy Bob out who's still paralyzed, but the sins are forgiven because Jesus said it. That would be the easiest thing to do because no one could prove it. No one would know whether his sins were forgiven or not because if it was just said, they wouldn't know, right? But he says, well, which would be easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or for me to say, get up and walk? And he goes on to say, and don't miss this part, but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. That is a blasphemous statement if you're not God. 80 times in scripture, 80 times in the New Testament, when Jesus was speaking, 80 times he called himself the son of man. In other words, Jesus referred to himself as the son of man more than any other title. He didn't say, I'm Jesus. He didn't say, I'm the Christ. He said, the son of man. You look through scripture, 80 different times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus makes a statement, the son of man, talking about himself. And so what does he say here? So that you will know, you scribes, you doubters, so that you will know that the son of man, me, has the power to forgive sins on this earth. In other words, so that you'll know that I'm God. I'm going to tell this man to get up and, and walk. 
He looks at that man. He says, get up. Take your bed. Go home. And instantly, Billy Bob stands up. The crowd is shocked. It even says, like, everybody there was amazed. They'd never seen anything like this, except for the scribes. I think you can read in the scripture and infer in the scripture that the scribes didn't come around to his way of thinking because they they had later work to do. We keep reading about the scribes and the Pharisees later in scripture, right? But everybody else is like, this is amazing because Billy Bob, who was paralyzed, he now jumps up. And because Jesus himself had said, which is the easier thing for me to say your sins are forgiven or for me to say get up and walk? He says, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. Guess now, if the easier thing is to say your sins are forgiven, guess what everybody believes about Billy Bob? Billy Bob can walk and Billy Bob has been forgiven by this man called Jesus, the son of man. What an amazing story. What an amazing miracle that, that, again, let's be honest, how many of you have ever heard a sermon or a, a podcast or read a book about this passage? I mean, how many of you have ever heard something? We, like most of us in this room have, right? But when you think about it from the context of like what we shared today, what page did I say it was on? Hold on, 180-something. 176, thank you for paying that. Was a, that was a test. You passed, good job. Okay, and so, but when you think about this passage in the way that we've kind of looked at it today with, with pulling out some of these little words that, that oftentimes we, we miss, like it's pretty amazing to think that Jesus in these 12 verses in Mark chapter two, here's what he did. He not only healed the man, that was a byproduct. That was not that big of a deal. It was for Billy Bob. Billy Bob's happy, right? But, but honestly, that wasn't the bigger deal, the bigger story from this passage. The bigger story from this passage is that Jesus himself Prove that he is God because of the challenge of the scribe, because of what scribes were thinking. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking and challenged them on what they were thinking and then proved their point. And what did I tell you were the three most important words in these 12 verses? Somebody, but God alone. In other words, the most important part of this passage is not the miracle. The most important part of this passage is the declaration that Jesus who walked on this earth is God. And so we go all the way back to where we started when it says, and then they brought the paralytic man and four people carried him. Again, I don't know how many people were in this group, but this is a group of individuals who were passionate about getting Billy Bob to Jesus. Passionate about getting Billy Bob into the presence of God. Passionate about bringing Billy Bob to the place where they could experience what so many others had experienced when they had been around this man named Jesus. They just wanted to get their friend to Jesus. Here's the question. What are we doing to get our friends to Jesus? What are we doing if if, if the passage teaches us that he is God? Then the natural question comes after that. Then why are we not doing everything that we possibly can to get people to Jesus? Why are we not doing whatever is necessary to get people into the presence of God? So let me give you four quick takeaways. Applications. Remember now, if we only read scripture for the point of reading the Bible as a history book, it's a great history book, but it's no different than any other history book. But if we read the Bible as the word of God, the Logos, and we read it for what it means to us, then that's where Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and it's powerful. It's different. It's not just a history book. You can read history books. I'm reading a book right now on, uh, on the leader of China. Uh, and, and, and that's a history book and it tells the stories and that's great but it's not living and it's powerful this is living and powerful why? because it's the word of God and we take out of it not just simply the story but we take out of it what does it mean to me so let me give you a quick, four quick takeaways the miraculous often happens when one takes the first step Billy Bob never would have been healed, number one. But more importantly, Billy Bob would never have been forgiven 
if some people didn't simply take the first step to get Billy Bob to Jesus. Now, that's true personally. In other words, when you need the miraculous in your life, the miraculous is not going to happen until you take the first step. Jesus is not running around throwing out wishes. He's not Oprah Winfrey kind of like, yeah, you get a car and you get a car and you get... That's not what Jesus does, right? What Jesus is, Jesus is faithful and Jesus is powerful and Jesus wants to minister to you and he wants to do the miraculous in your life. And I know that's true. Why? Because scripture says that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you ever ask or think. First John chapter five says that anything that we ask in Jesus name, God hears us. And when God hears us, he will do it. So God wants to do the miraculous in our lives. The only thing that keeps us from experiencing it, from walking into it, is being unwilling to take the first step. So we got to take the first step. Here's the second thing. Second thing. Trusting him for the small things often results in the bigger things. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly more. So in other words... That passage has said he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. That means that every time that you go to God and you ask God for something, God can do so much more. And it doesn't matter how much you ask him for, God can always do more. So no matter how big of a prayer you've been praying, no matter how big of a miracle that you need, no matter how big a miraculous touch of the hand of God and the power of God in your life that you need, regardless of how big that thing might be, God can do so much more. And aren't you gr grateful and so glad and just so overwhelmed by the fact that there's nothing that you could ever need from God that God can not only meet it, but exceed it. That God will go way beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Aren't you glad about that? Now, come on. Aren't you glad about that? So trusting him in the small things often results in far bigger things. Why? Because that's what God wants to do. It's not like he's sitting up saying, oh, here he comes again. Okay, here you go. God wants to do it. God wants to do the miraculous. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly more. God wants to do far more than you could ever imagine. God wants to do those things. That is who our God is to so trust him. Trust him in the small things. And then buckle your seatbelt, baby. That is not in scripture, what I just said. Okay, here's the third thing. In order to experience God's greatest gifts, we must overcome our doubts. How many of you have ever come to the place in your life where you've gone to God, you've gotten on your knees before God, God, I really need you to do this. God, please do this. God, I really need you. God, would you please do this? And by the way, our prayers usually sound a lot like that, don't they? They don't sound a whole lot like, oh, God, you're amazing. You're an awesome God. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Usually, hey, God, I need you to show up here, right? That's usually what our prayers sound like. But how many of you times have you ever done that kind of prayer? Like, God, I really need you to do this. I need you to act here. God, I need you to do this now. I need you to show up in a big and a mighty way. And then the minute that we say amen, we get up and we go out and we try to do it on our own. We try to pull it off on our own. Here's why. Because we believe God and we love God, but ultimately there's still that little doubt that persists that what we're asking God to do, well, I better get out there and do this myself. That's an old statement. God helps those who help themselves. That is a lie. God helps those, period. Now, that's not to say that when you need God to show up, you go find a lazy bear, a lazy bear. I'm sorry. I saw a bear this week. I got a cool video, but that's not, that's not the point. Uh, a lazy chair, a lazy, you know, what do you call them? Lazy boys, right? Lazy boy. You find a lazy boy or a rocking chair, sit on the front porch and just kind of chill out and wait for God to show up and do nothing. I'm not saying that, right? I mean, obviously... Be, Go back to point number one. You got to take the first step. Yes, you got to act. You got to do. You got to serve. You got to make, you know, the, the, the effort. Absolutely. But understand this. God doesn't need you to do the miraculous. Don't ever forget. God doesn't need you 
to do what only God can do. And when you believe that, when you get to the point in your life where you recognize, okay, I get it now. God doesn't need me to do what God can do. It will change the way you pray. It'll change the way that you take this faith journey and this walk because then what you're doing now is you're leaning into and leaning on the power of God. Remember that old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms? Like you gotta get there. So we gotta get rid of our doubts. And the fourth one, in many ways, the greatest hindrance to the miracle is us, not him. It's us. Because of doubts, yes. Because of not taking the first steps, yes. All of the, come up, whatever statement you want to make, whatever phrasing you want to throw out there, and the answer is yes, 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 yes. The greatest hindrance to experiencing the miracles of God is us. It's not him. Jesus was sitting in that house that day just waiting for the roof tiles to begin to fall. He knew what was coming. In fact, he probably gathered the people together a little bit quicker. Remember how it said immediately they gathered together? He probably said, guys, come on in here quick, quick. You don't want to miss this, right? You know, like get, get over here quick. Let's get in the room because I want to preach the word. I want to preach the word. Like get in here, get in the windows. Like you can't get, go outside and look through the window. Like, hey, you don't want to miss this because I'm going to preach the word. And then the tiles begin to fall. You see, the greatest hindrance to experiencing those moves of God, it's us. It's in our doubts and it's in our failure to act. It's in our lack of patience. It's in our laziness. So we've got to make sure we've got to get to the place where we literally do nothing more than lean on the everlasting arms of God. Because God can do what you can't, but he can do so much more. And aren't you grateful that's who our God is? Now, obviously, we're sitting here on March the 17th. Two weeks is Easter. I would be a horrible pastor if I didn't come back to that hook, that question that I've verbalized three or four times today. What are we doing to bring people to Jesus. What are we doing to bring people to Jesus? Studies have shown, studies that have been done by many different research organizations and different outfits around the world that will tell us that people, when invited, will show go, go to church with you. When you say, hey, I would love for you to go to church with me. Amazing. The story, the numbers are in this. 70, 80, 90% of the time, they will show up. So again, I ask the question, what are we doing to get people to Jesus? Can you imagine if Billy Bob was sitting over there on the mat and he's sitting there just kind of hanging out. He's got the remote in one hand. He's got a Diet Coke in the other. I know it's Billy Bob, but he's not drinking beer. He's drinking Diet Coke. I mean, okay, he's sitting over there drinking Diet Coke. He's sitting there on the mat and he's kind of hanging out, watching TV. What would have happened if not one of his friends had even had the thought, you know, I wonder if we should take Billy Bob to see Jesus. What if not one of his friends would have even come up with the idea, hey, why don't we go over and let's get some people together and let's, let's, let's go carry Billy Bob down the street, you know, go around the corner down to, you know, down to Peter's house or Andrew's house or Peter's mother-in-law's house. Let, let, let's go down the street and, and let's go see, because that guy, Jesus, is, is back. He's come back and, and he's at his house. Like, let's go get Billy Bob and let's see what can happen. What would have happened to Billy Bob? Well, my guess is this. Billy Bob probably would have spent the rest of his days hanging out in the house with the remote control in his hand, with the Diet Coke in another, and he never would have walked, but far more important, he never would have experienced the power and the presence of salvation through God and God alone. So again, what are we doing? What are we doing to get people to Jesus? Let's pray. God, today, thank you for your word. Lord, a story that we've heard over and over again 
But God, once again, as we've heard it yet another time here this morning, God, a story that, that, Lord, that definitely gets our heart. It definitely speaks to us, God, because we see ourselves as Billy Bob. We see ourselves as the friends. And sometimes we even see ourselves as the scribes. God, we can read into this passage and in so many different ways we can find our own lives of doubt. We can find our own lives of, of pain and suffering. So God, we just thank you that you teach us. And everything that you did and everything that you said, God, you teach us what we need to hear. So God, I just thank you for that. And today, if we're here and gathered in this room, watching, listening, God, if there's someone here today that needs to experience that miraculous touch of the hand of God and needs salvation today, God, they, they need their sins to be forgiven. God, I pray today in this moment that they would make that declaration in their own hearts that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died and rose again. So I call in your name, save me today. God, maybe there's someone here today that, Lord, they, they need that miracle in their life. They need that thing to happen. Whatever that thing is, God, they need it. God, I pray that you would give them faith that is overwhelming. God, that you would give them the kind of faith that, that even surprises them of believing, God, that you can do, but you can do so much more. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, our team is here, and altars open as always. If you're here and you need to meet Jesus, if you're like that guy, Billy Bob, maybe today no one's gonna come over and pick you up and carry you down, but maybe you need to carry yourself to the altar today and just come and say, listen, I wanna meet Jesus. Our team is here, we'd love to talk with you about who he is and what he's done. Maybe today what you wanna do is come here, and just kneel here and just pray, God, God, give me faith. God, give me the faith that, that is overwhelming. God, I need a deeper faith and a stronger faith. Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you need to come and, and join our church family or comfort baptism or wh whatever it is. Uh, whatever God is speaking to you today, like, man, just, just act. Remember what we said a few moments ago? It takes the first step. And so today, that first step to wherever you need to go today, I just encourage you, take it. So today we're going to stand and Zach's going to lead us. And as we sing through just one time, altar's open. And I encourage you to act and move right now. Zach. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep you covered I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. For me. Oh God, my God. God, today we stand on your faithfulness. God, we today declare together corporately in this place, God, we know you're able to do exceedingly abundantly more. So God, we stand here today, we lean on the everlasting arms of God and we just say, God, we need you. Oh God, we need you. God, I pray that you would help us today as we leave this place, that we would leave here with a confidence, a confidence of knowing that the Son of Man, that Jesus is with us and that He has overcome every hurdle, every obstacle, that He has given us the hope and the power of salvation because that is what He does. He is God. Thank you for that gift. So help us to be confident today as we go out into a world that needs to hear the name of Jesus and give us the opportunities, and then give us the courage to act on those opportunities. 
to bring people to Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you move, no one move. I want you to look at me today. When you leave today at every door, we have put together these invitation cards for Easter. It's two weeks away. It's a lot easier than digging a hole in a roof. Pick up these cards and take them with you. Hand them out. Invite people to come with you on Easter Sunday. Not because Thomas Road is the only place they can hear about Jesus, but it is a place they will hear about Jesus. Bring them and let's pray that God gives us revival. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad you joined us. If you prayed to receive Christ today, we'd love to hear from you. We want to help you as you begin this journey of faith in Jesus Christ. So send us an email to the address on the screen, pastor at trbc.org. Likewise, if you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus, but you'd like to know more, well, we're here to help you. So just reach out to us. We'd love to tell you more. Our mission at Thomas Road is to change our world by developing Christ followers who love God and love people. And if you'd like to help us fulfill that mission by giving to our ministry, then go to the link on your screen and make your contribution today. Help us help others with the life-changing truth of God's love.